life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Yeah, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. That is unless you talk about Kansas athletics, because you typically know what you're going to get. The men's basketball team, well, they're known for winning. But the football team in Kansas, well, they're not known for winning. In fact, lately when it comes to football futility, the Jayhawks reign supreme in this department. As a matter of fact, did you know that since 2009, for the last eight years, Kansas is the only team amongst the Power 5 conference schools that has not gone to a bowl game. Hard to believe, huh? And that means 64 teams if you count the two major independents. Life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Now, this is when the expression, life is like a box of chocolates, you never know what you're going to get, applies. Last year, despite Kansas going two wins and ten losses, which normally would get your coach either fired or put him at least on the hot seat. In this case for Kansas, you know what? They gave him a raise and a contract extension. And you might be thinking, what in the H-E double hockey sticks is going on? But that's true with Coach Beatty. Contract extension and his salary doubled from 800 k to now $1.6 million per year to Coach Kansas and an additional $100,000 each year added to the remainder of the contract. Now, two reasons why I believe that this happened. Number one, Kansas appreciates progression. Two wins in 2016 is two more wins than what they had in all of 2015. And number two, unlike Turner Gill and Charlie Weiss, the two full-time head coaches that preceded Beatty, KU's athletic department does believe that Coach Beatty is going to provide a brighter future for this program. In other words, they're going to continue to improve. Um, Big thing for Kansas, a big hire this past offseason on the offensive side was the hiring of Doug Meacham. Now the new offensive coordinator, that name should sound familiar in the Big 12, especially if you live in Fort Worth because he, of course, was a former co-offensive head of that TCU offense. He and Sonny Cumbie really turned that offense around, took it from plain vanilla to exciting primarily through the air. Now a big thing to keep in mind, though, that Doug Meacham will not have the luxury of this year. He doesn't have the talent that he had at TCU, especially at quarterback. There's no Trevon Boykin walking out of that KU locker room. I can promise you that. Matter of fact, KU's QB situation right now, very unsettled. So they could either go with the guy that started the last three games of a year ago, Carter Stanley, or they could play Peyton Bender. Now, Bender uh, played a couple of years under Mike Leach at Washington State, the air raid attack, and also played your junior college ball under a similar offense. So at least he'll be in a style of offense that he is used to, but Bender is not a running type quarterback. So we'll see who gets the job and how KU's offense will move. Now, one thing they don't have to worry about is wide receiver. They're proving that, that Steven Sims Jr., pretty nice player, 72 receptions a year ago for the Jayhawks and seven touchdowns, and his teammates should help out quite a bit too, returning starter in Laquivian Gonzalez. But one thing that Meacham does prefer are the bigger physical type receivers, and Gonzalez and Sims are not huge receivers. In fact, both are under six feet tall. Now, one guy that should help out in the mix is Peyton Charlotte, who used to play at Alabama under Nick Saban. The ground game, well, they lost their leading rusher to graduation, so in a way it's back to the chalkboard as far as the running attack goes. Khalil Herbert, they're hoping could be that big breakthrough running back, but last year his 2016 season was screwed because of a foot injury, and maybe Octavius Matthews can help out. Another one of those Juco transfers, as a matter of fact, um, he was a teammate one year in Juco ball with the QB, uh, Peyton Bender. Offensive line has to get more physical. It's that simple. When you look at Kansas last year, uh, they were 59th in the country in passing, not bad, but as far as rushing, pathetic, 116th in the country at rushing, um, only 119 yards on the ground per contest. But one bright spot, I think, is the left tackle, that is Akeem Adeniji. His stock continues to rise. Remember, he arrived at Kansas not long ago, weighing about 260 pounds, but he's added about 30 pounds of muscle to the frame at 290, so that helps when your left tackle has uh, added a little bit of bulk. Um, the other uh, one of the other starters for Kansas coming back on the offensive line is the left guard uh, Jason Rhodes, who is a senior. And one guy getting a second chance uh, for Kansas um, is a guy that used to play for Alabama. I'm talking about Charles Baldwin. He'll play the other tackle on the right side. 
was kicked off of Nick Saban's team for violation of team rules not long ago. So we'll see if Baldwin can make the most of his second opportunity. Now, looking at the defense for KU, what was a big strength for them? Of course, you might be thinking pass defense because they were number one in the Big 12 in pass D. But that part might be a little bit skewed. Number one, they were affected because of a good pass rush, okay, which we'll talk about in a second. But number two, teams that played Kansas knew that they could run the ball and run it effectively and run all day down Kansas' throat. You knew that if you played Kansas, you did not have to worry about throwing the ball 300-plus yards per game or throwing it for four TDs per contest. You knew that the ground game was more than enough, and a lot of teams really stuck to that formula. So I know that Kansas was talented last year in the secondary to a degree. They're going to miss Fish Smiths in the safety. But by and large, uh, teams really made the most out of the running attack. That's why Kansas was very pathetic in the rush D department, giving up 236 yards per game. That was 114th in the nation. But one good thing about Kansas is, Defensive line, they return most of them, and they are good at rushing the quarterback. That's their biggest strength, including Kansas's first ever consensus all Big 12 selection. That's Dorrance Armstrong at six feet four. He's another guy that bulked up a little bit from his time at high school to now, where he's a junior three years later, about 40 pounds later. Um, he's a guy that can get to the quarterback and make plays happen. 20 tackles for loss last year and 10 quarterback sacks. His teammate, Daniel Wise, helped out a year ago at defensive tackle, three sacks. And you do have one of two expected starters on the defensive side this year as seniors. Uh, that is uh, the Isaac Davis, the upperclassman at the other defensive tackle. In terms of linebackers, um, couple of uh, guys that did not start all the way last year. One would have if it wasn't for a leg injury, and that was uh, Joe Deneen. Uh, Deneen last year at linebacker um, had a hamstring injury, so his year was obviously very limited. In terms of the secondary, the secondary a year ago, we mentioned the pass D, but we mentioned a big part of that was because teams used the run option instead of throwing the ball as often as they would against other opponents. And to make matters a little more complicated, now you only have one full-time starter back in the 4-2-5 uh, defensive alignment, and that is Mike Lee, a sophomore, leading returning tackler for the Jayhawks, 77 tackles, known as a physical-type safety. But again, you're going to be very raw in the other areas of the secondary, so that is a bit of a concern. Um, one element that Kansas can really improve upon before we get to the special teams, and that is Turnovers. Look, if you're not as talented as the other team, which Kansas has faced from time to time, that's one thing. But it's another thing when you're irresponsible at taking care of the ball. Last year, the Jayhawks had 36 turnovers, 36, and they only forced 22. That's a turnover margin of minus 14, and that'll get you in trouble all the time. So we'll see if Kansas can improve upon the turnover margin. If so, that might lead to to a win that maybe you weren't count, counting on Kansas having. Special teams-wise, uh, they do return the punter. He's a senior, and the kicker looks like will be a true freshman, so that could be an adventure. Special teams-wise, as we mentioned, the kicker and punter, when you talk about the punt return game for Kansas, they've got to get better in this area. Last year, they would have been better off just calling a fair catch every time, but instead, Kansas ended up with a punt return average of minus 1.5 yards. Um, field position, so vital in games, and special teams could be a big part of that. But last year, it helped hurt the cause for Kansas, at least as far as the punting return game. All right, so let's talk about the schedule for KU. If you don't win that opener against Southeast Missouri State, you can count on a winless season just like they had two years ago. Central Michigan closed out last year slumping big time, losing five of their last six, including getting beat by 45 points against Tulsa. But Central Michigan also won at Oklahoma State. Uh, unless you ask Mike Gundy, he'll probably give you a different version of that. Then you go to Ohio, one of the best teams in the Mid-American Conference. I'm not counting on Kansas to win. And I'm not counting on the Jayhawks to win their Big 12 opener, which is at home against West Virginia. By the way, Will Greer, the Florida transfer, is expected to start from the beginning of the season. Good news for West Virginia. Obviously bad news for all other defenses in the league. And that does include the Jayhawks. The next two games, never know, might be a win. Texas Tech is one of the declining teams in the country. You get them at home. You got to go to Iowa State, though. And even though on paper it looks like a pick'em game, remember the Jayhawks have not won a road game since 2009. 
And for some reason, Kansas always plays TCU tough. I can't figure that out. Last year, the Horned Frogs were lucky to escape Lawrence with a one-point win. Two weeks later, Baylor. This is a team that doesn't have a whole lot of depth, and that could work in Kansas's favor, getting Baylor in early November. And the last three games, forget about a win. Texas on the road. That's going to be a revenge game for the Longhorns. And then possibly the two best teams in the conference, and you get them back-to-back -back to close out 2017. At home against Oklahoma for Senior Day, and you go to Stillwater to face the Cowboys. Yeah, thank you. Good luck. Thanks for playing. Where's my party and gift? Vegas win total has Kansas at 2.5. I think the Jayhawks exceed that, but it's close. I've got them winning just three games. There are some nice pieces to this team, especially at receiver, but not enough pieces to form a cohesive enough unit to win consistently. The Jayhawks will make strides, but they'll be baby steps, not giant leaps. That's my look at Kansas. See you next time.